The end of humanity. Everything around was covered with snow. Mason and Max moved through the endless snowy desert. Even though they were warmly dressed and well equipped, the frost penetrated them to the bones. Not far from them a lonely frozen tree could be seen, near which was the silhouette of a man. They came closer and closer, and it was clear that the silhouette of a man was tied with a rope to a tree. Max assumed that this man ended his life by hanging. Mason took a closer look at the silhouette and said that it is really very difficult to survive in such conditions, so he understands his action like no one else. They had already approached almost densely and began to hear the silhouette of a man growling loudly and displeasedly. A crashed helicopter lay near a tree, and next to it a frozen head and hand were sticking out from under the snow. Max was surprised and asked Mason to look at the shape of the protruding corpse. He was wearing General's shoulder straps. However, for a very long time, judging by the decomposed body, it was not a general, but a rotting piece of living meat. Mason had already aimed his machine gun at him, but Max took out his knife and said that he would deal with it himself. He walked up to the former general growling at him, quietly asked for forgiveness, and stuck his knife right into his head. After that, Max suddenly took out his knife. The general's body no longer made more than one sound. However, behind them, near a tree, a case suddenly opened. He began to repeat over and over again the phrase that the respondent's biometric signal was not recorded. Mason immediately turned around since it was the first time he had seen some kind of security system go off after killing another zombie. Without thinking for a long time, Mason began to move towards the computer, but in front of him there was another dead obstacle. The soldier hanging from the tree was ready to pounce on him and tear him to pieces if the noose around his neck had not greatly hampered him. This was not a very pleasant sight. The zombie pulled the rope with his neck and tried to break away from the tree, but he clearly did not have enough strength to do this, because the rope held his spine tightly. Mason brought his machine gun right under the head of the hanged zombie, after which he fired one accurate shot, muffled by the zombie's head. The zombie's blood sprayed directly onto Mason, and he was able to cover himself with his hand in time. At the same moment, the hanged zombie toppled over and fell onto the snow. Max asked if Mason was okay. To his question, Mason simply nodded his head and at the same time threw off the collar with the help of which he was pulling a sled with provisions and their things. Mason approached the case and began to examine the documents that were in it. In addition to the documents, the case contained a chip that most likely belonged to the general whom Max had just killed. It was written on the chip that it was from the Capitol's Defense Command bunker, which could be used in the event of the end of the world for high-ranking people. Mason carefully examined the key on which a long code was written. Could it really be the key to that same Capitol Defense bunker? Mason couldn't believe his eyes. Mason put the key in the inner pocket of his jacket and said that first they should head towards the Capitol Defense Command. At best, they will arrive in ten days. Suddenly the snow began to move away from under Mason's feet. It was an avalanche. Mason managed to shout to Max not to come closer, and in an instant, Mason, along with a suitcase of documents and their personal belongings, began to fall down. It was a small snowfall, and Mason found himself on the road a little covered in snow. He did not lose consciousness and began to try to get up. A car door suddenly began to open near him. A frozen black zombie hand immediately fell out of it. Mason quickly stood up and took a fighting stance, because the zombies would not wait until he recovered from the fall. Mason began to silently beg the zombies to sit inside and not crawl out. However, having smelled fresh human living meat, they could not just continue to sit in the snow-covered car. Under the onslaught of zombies, the car door suddenly swung open. They were hungry as never before, and their teeth were chattering non-stop like animals. Mason looked at them in horror and was clearly not happy that they managed to get out. The zombie teenagers quickly began to move towards Mason. He couldn't believe his eyes, these were children. This was not easy for a living, conscious person to experience. Even though they were zombies, they still looked like children. Mason charged his machine gun. The children had already started running towards him. Mason took aim and was ready to start shooting. He decided not to open fire until they reached him. But they were driven only by the thirst to satisfy their food needs. All that remained of humanity in these zombies was the appearance of small children who once lived joyfully and carefree. Mason understood this very well and nevertheless began to shoot at them while simultaneously asking them not to approach. Since the zombies were not very tall, they moved much faster and more agile. The girl was hit in the head by a bullet 
and immediately fell into the snow. But the boy was even smaller than her and Mason was only able to hit him on the body, and the bullets tore off his arm. But the little zombie had already rushed at Mason. He stopped shooting and started using the machine gun as a shield against the baby zombie. The kid grabbed the machine gun with his teeth and chewed on it, constantly trying to reach Mason's face. He looked straight at him and asked the baby zombie to stop. A trembling from what was happening ran through Mason's whole body. He had never imagined seeing something like this before, just as he had never killed such small zombies before. Mason decided that it was time to end this no matter the cost and threw the little zombie aside. The zombie baby fell on the snow a few meters from Mason. Mason said only one phrase, the living must remain alive. Without keeping him waiting for long, the zombie baby rushed at Mason again. He pointed his machine gun at him and again said that the living must live, then pulled the trigger. However, no shot was fired. Mason looked down at his machine gun. He didn't have much time left. He pulled the bolt, and it became clear that the cartridge was jammed in the barrel. He managed to quickly eliminate the delay and raised his machine gun again. The baby zombie was already a meter away from him and rushed at the machine gun. The muzzle of the machine gun rested directly on the baby zombie's only eye. At the same moment, Mason pulled the trigger and the machine gun fired. The sound of an M16 machine gun shot, muffled by the zombie's head, sounded again. The shot sent the baby zombie flying several meters away. Mason began to breathe quickly, reassuring himself that everything was over. He stood in the middle of huge snow caps and looked at the bodies of zombie kids, who now did not make more than one sound, and all around you could only hear how quickly snow flakes were falling to the ground. Max asked Mason whether he should stay at the top or should he go down and help. Mason told Max to be ready to go out, but not to come down. He will collect the papers and quickly go up to him. Mason was collecting papers when he suddenly began to hear the cracking of ice under his feet. Mason was not the only one above who heard the crack of ice, but also zombies floating under the ice. Without listening to Mason, Max began to descend from the mountain. Mason slowly and calmly put the papers back into the case, and again reminded Max that he had ordered him to stay upstairs. However, Max began to dust himself off and said that he could not stand aside and was ready to help. Mason picked up the case and the machine gun and began to quickly move back to the top. He told Max to look at his feet because they were standing on the water. They urgently needed to evacuate. The situation now was not the best that could happen to them. Mason began to move towards Max, when suddenly Max was attacked from behind. He didn't have time to do anything when another zombie attacked him from behind from the snow and bit him in the neck. Mason stopped and couldn't believe that Max was so unlucky after what they went through together. Mason understood that Max would now also become a zombie and began to slowly raise his machine gun. Max was already being chewed by several zombies, and he was screaming in pain and begging Mason to shoot him. Max was almost completely pulled into the abyss of zombies and his screams could be clearly heard around him. A tear quickly rolled down Mason's cheek. He was not ready to lose his soldier. Gritting his teeth, Mason decided to ease his suffering and shot him in the head. The sound of the shot immediately attracted zombies who ate Max. Mason immediately realized this and started running. In the snow, he began to quickly climb up the slope. Grabbing the roots of a lonely tree, he climbed up step by step, because only death awaited him below. He perfectly understood that he could either fall through the ice, or the zombies would eat him just like Max. There was no turning back. After a few minutes of difficult climbing up the snowy mountain, he still managed to reach the top. He cried, looked down and could not come to terms with the death of his partner. He should have been more vigilant, he said to himself. However, Mason had no time to grieve, he again took the rope, with which he pulled the sled with provisions and clothes. He quickly threw the rope over himself and began to run. It was necessary to run as quickly as possible, and as far away from this place as possible. Many years have passed since those events. Mason was still walking in the harness and pulling the sled with his things. Now Mason was walking along Seoul, Olympic Route Street, Building 448. At the same moment, on the same street, several people were hiding in a dilapidated building. The traveler sat indoors with his wife and said that he did not understand how the owner of this secluded corner managed to survive in such conditions. The owner was making coffee and began his story by saying that he was simply lucky. Once upon a time they had their own beapiary, where he and his wife spent all their time. That day they were just collecting honey. They noticed that the bees were behaving strangely, as if they had gone mad. 
What was happening looked like the queen bee had decided to eradicate her swarm. The bees attacked each other and circled in mortal combat. At some point the sky became covered with black clouds. After which, with great speed and intensity, huge stones began to fall from the sky. Such a terrifying sight they had never seen before. They had no time to think. The owner, whose name was Tom, grabbed his numb wife by the hand and ran to the dugout with supplies. When they were already sitting in the dugout, the sky, the earth and in general everything around shook and hummed loudly, as if everything had plunged into chaos. They were tossed from side to side like little toy dolls, it was very scary. At that moment they prayed to whoever they could, the Lord, Buddha, and Allah. Tom turned with a smile on his face, two ready-made cups of coffee in his hands, and said that it was luck that helped them stay alive that day, and still does not leave him. Tom put the cups on the table and asked the guests to drink their coffee quickly before it got cold. The traveler began to warm his hands on the cups and asked if it was real coffee, because coffee is a very rare drink, and also two cups. Tom smiled cheerfully and asked the guests not to think about it, but just enjoy the drink. The traveler held a still hot cup of coffee in his hands and quietly said that he had not inhaled such a pleasant smell for many years. Tom looked at the traveler with sparkling eyes and waited for him to drink coffee, he quietly whispered that man is such an animal, that if he is filled with the desire to live, he will find a way to survive. Tom grinned and reflecting said that travelers from different parts of the planet often visit him, exchange various things with him, and he always has something to offer in return, mainly food, of course. The traveler's wife, warming her hands on a cup of coffee, said that they were very lucky that they were able to get to Seoul. She asked Tom what kind of things he makes for resale. Tom nodded his head affirmatively and said that even in this lost world, you need to do something and survive. She said that she knew a little about needlework and could help Tom create new things for resale. Emily, with all her soul and open heart, wanted to help Tom with at least something. Because he was so kind to them, he let them in, warmed them up, and even gave them coffee. Her husband put his hand on her shoulder and asked her to stop, because it was not nice say so. so after all, they are seeing Tom for the first time. Suddenly he has his own business secrets that he would not want to share with the first people he meets. Emily immediately stopped and apologized to Tom. She just wanted to express her gratitude for his friendliness. Tom smiled and said that there was nothing wrong with that. He likes such good, energetic people. The traveler took a closer look at Tom and said that he had often seen a smile like Tom's. It looked very familiar. Tom took out two flashlights from the cabinet and said that he often hears this from guests. Most likely he inherited the smile from his uncle, or maybe even from his mother. Well, since they want to settle here, Tom decided to show them his pride. She began to tap the flashlight on his hand and said that in order to survive they must first study the local market. The truth is, I do unusual things. Tom suggested that the guests demonstrate everything live, so as not to beat around the bush. Tom, with a smile on his face, said that he would make an exception for them and while they were looking at his pride, he asked Emily to wash the dishes, to which she certainly agreed and got to work. They began to go down to the basement together, and with each step it became darker and darker. Tom turned on his flashlight. He slowly descended and turned to the traveler with disbelief and said that he didn't even know whether he should show his treasures, to which the traveler began to beg him to demonstrate what had helped Tom survive for so long in this post-apocalyptic world. They went down for a long time, and the traveler said that most likely Tom was really creating something extraordinary, since it was hidden so deep below. Tom and the traveler went into the basement, and said that he didn't seem to be doing anything special, but for one such thing people were ready to shell out everything they had just to buy it. As soon as they entered, the traveler was stunned by what he saw. Were there really live pigs there? Tom said it was just material. And here is what Tom talked about from the very beginning, something that is so valued in the current world. On the table there were canned meats in huge quantities, one on top of the other, and even resembled a store shelf. Tom said that these are not just canned goods, they are made from selected meat. The traveler approached them and told Tom that he had not eaten canned food for several years. In the current world it was like gold. Tom took off his jacket, started putting on gloves, and said that lately, because of the damn zombies, fresh flesh has not been found. Tom stood near his table with tools and chose. The traveler said that he and his wife tried to eat wild animals, but most of them were rotten inside. And these pigs looked very clean and well-fed. The traveler said that his request might sound shameless, 
but maybe he could take one can and share it with his wife. When the traveler turned around, Tom stood behind him, already dressed in a waterproof apron for cutting meat, and in his hands was a hammer. He quietly said that the traveler really had no shame or conscience. The traveler was frightened. He immediately asked again what Tom answered him. Tom said that the traveler has no shame. The traveler looked at Tom and asked why he took the hammer. Tom, with a smile on his face, said that the traveler was saying some nonsense. How, in his opinion, did he make so much canned food, really from a couple of precious pigs? He only adds 20% pork to his canned food, but the remaining 80 are completely different meat. The traveler understood everything. He began to back away with fear in his eyes and cold sweat on his face. He retreated further and further back, when suddenly he ran into something with his back. Turning around, he saw the secret ingredient that Tom added to his canned food. The traveler remembered where Tom's smile was so familiar to him from. At the same moment, the hammer hit the target with great speed, and blood sprayed from the head. The pigs immediately began to rush around the room and squeal loudly. A few drops of blood fell on Tom's face. He looked at the traveler lying on the floor and waited to see if he could finish speaking, or if one blow was enough. The traveler, choking on blood, said Tom, Tom the Ripper. Tom was even a little happy that he had once gained popularity. He turned around and loudly called Emily to come downstairs. He again loudly asked her to come down, and heard that she was quickly going down the stairs. The smile did not leave Tom's face, because now he had enough meat for a new portion of canned food. The basement was filled with the smell of fresh blood. Drops of blood dripped one after another into a bucket standing on the floor. Tom stood near the bucket and said out loud that he still doesn't understand why the little people strive to get to Seoul. Tom, like many maniacs, loved to talk to himself. He said that it was also better for him that people were going in droves to Seoul. It was becoming easier and easier for him to handle the farm. He asked Emily why she was looking at him with that look. Was she really offended by being hung next to a pig? Just look at your body. How you differ from a pig. It's just one to one. Look here at the fillet, here at the sirloin, and here at this lard. And there are two eyes too, the same pair of ears. And the blood is exactly the same scarlet. In a word, people are like pigs. Suddenly the bell rang upstairs. Tom got a little angry. Even though you install cameras at your workplace, as soon as the meat arrives, they immediately start ringing. The stationary radio standing on the barrel made hissing sounds. Tom took the radio and said that the butcher shop was on the line. They told him that the car they were talking about they had. A battery with a manganese battery. There were twelve of them. This made Tom happy. He praised the person on the other end of the line and asked when they would send him the order. The man replied that this time the goods were difficult to get, so he could exchange them for thirty cans. Tom was indignant, because thirty cans is a real robbery. The man on the radio said that his boss Kim's birthday was in a couple of weeks, so he was ordered to be sure to prepare something worthwhile no matter what. Tom got angry. What birthday is it? So many years ago the calendar disappeared. What birthday can we talk about? Tomorrow they can come for twenty cans, and he doesn't care about the rest. The radio was silent for a short time, and a minute later it hissed again. The person on the other end said that tomorrow he would send people for delivery, and who would be sent with them. Tom smiled again and said that he liked the new young girls, Amanda and Becca. But the man on the radio said that they themselves needed them. It was very inconvenient to constantly send him two girls, so he would only send one. This did not suit Tom. He said that everyone wants to eat meat, and now they decided to play masters with him. He got angry in a second and started shouting into the walkie-talkie. Tom said that he could come to them himself and restore order in their hierarchy. Tom roared like an animal that had not received its prey. He said that he was ready to come to them and divide them into people and cattle. Maybe this way their brains would fall into place, and they would finally understand who could be refused and who could not. If they want to live, then they shouldn't contradict Tom. He was filled with rage. He tried to calm down a little and threw the radio away, stopped, and exhaled a little. Then he picked up the radio again and calmly announced that this was the end of the message. The radio was silent for about a minute, and finally the man said that tomorrow he would send two girls along with the package. This suited Tom. He turned off the radio. How dare they even argue with him? The tension turned into a headache. Tom thought that it would be nice to visit them and dance the knife dance so that they would not forget who the real boss is here. No, no, we need to think positive today, Amanda and Becca. Tom decided to go to bed early today in order to properly relieve tension tomorrow. 
Mason was watching Tom through the optical sight. He zoomed his sight closer and further out to understand how he knew this place so well. Masson remembered this place and realized that he had finally arrived in Seoul. He wondered what kind of person it was who single-handedly privatized this huge building. If only this person turned out to be good, Mason still needs to find out a lot about the situation happening in Seoul. Mason did not dare to immediately go to the discovered person, first, he should watch him. If everything looks safe, then you can go to this person. On the other hand, Mason saw a half-sunken huge cruiser. It's time to look for a place to stay for the night. Mason, crunching his saws in the snow, went inside the ship. He examined the ship from the inside. There are many windows in the guest rooms. If even a weak light leaks out, Mason will expose himself to danger both from passing zombies and from living people. In truth, zombies, of course, scared Mason a lot, but he was much more afraid of the living because they have intelligence. After a few minutes of wandering around the ship, Mason came across the men's room. Still, there is no safer place than the toilet, Mason thought. However, since the ship was upside down, the toilet was above Mason's head. On some level, this was good Mason, without thinking for a long time, took the flashlight into his mouth and began to climb. Taking into account the fact that it was necessary to lift all the things, it took a little longer than expected, but this was not the first time Mason was in such a situation, and within five minutes he was in the toilet with his things. He slowly began to climb the partitions of the booths to the very top. Having climbed up, he began to tap the ceiling of the toilet. Naturally, in the new location it was necessary to provide a bladeless escape route. Another winter day full of snow and cold has arrived. Zombies, like everywhere else, wandered around Seoul in search of fresh meat. This zombie's attention was drawn to the unusual sound of the engine, causing it to growl loudly as the sound quickly approached. As soon as the sound reached its approaching volume, the zombie's head flew off his shoulders. Then she rolled down, plastering the surrounding snow on herself. It was one of the gang's followers who rushed past the zombies on a snowmobile. Immediately behind him rushed the second follower of the gang, who, just like the first, stuck his sword into the zombie. However, the sword broke and part of it remained stuck in the frozen zombie. The next guy flying behind them on a snowboard decided not to stand aside and take a ride on the zombies. He landed on her back and rolled over her like a snowy mound. However, the sword sticking out of it continued to ride with him. He began to scream like crazy, considering that a fragment of a sword was sticking out of his leg. The boss driving behind them in the car just laughed because of what had happened. Amanda and Becca were riding in the car with sad faces. They all moved straight towards the building that belonged to Tom. When they drove far enough, Mason got out of the covered snow. None of the bandits even suspected that Mason was watching them. Mason watched what was happening, and he became increasingly convinced that Seoul posed a huge threat, not just because of the huge number of zombies, but also because of the huge number of surviving psychopaths. The bandits stopped at the entrance to the building, turned off their motorcycles and began to wait for Tom's arrival. The guy who ran over the blade of the knife was barely hobbling and could not put his foot on his feet. He said that first he needed to patch himself up at the old man's house, and only then the rest of the things. At that moment, Tom went outside from his house and drew the attention of the young guy that no one allowed him to do this. He started shouting at the old man and said that he could look at his leg himself. Doesn't such an injury require urgent treatment? Tom didn't think for a long time and said that he could help him if the boy had a problem in his leg. Tom suggested cutting it off at the ankle. But if the problem is in the brains, which send pain signals, then Tom could well cut off somewhere up to the neck so that they would not interfere. The kid took his butterfly knife out of his pocket and pointed it at Tom and said that the old man had completely lost his head if he imagined himself to be a big shot because the guys were paying him then he could solve this problem with one blow. At that very second, Tom took out his huge knife from his bosom and stuck it right to the boy's throat. Tom said that he would give just three seconds so that those who should not stay here would disappear. The guy only had time to swallow his saliva from the fear of final reprisal. There was one second left. Tom smiled with all his teeth, and at that moment he looked like an obsessed maniac. He said that he would keep his scalp as a present. At that moment... Another bandit grabbed the boy by the hood and threw him sharply back, shouting that if he forgot, their task was only to deliver the order. The bandit apologized to Tom for his friend and in his defense, said that the boy had not participated in forays for a long time and could not distinguish shit from urine. Tom rubbed his huge knife on his forearm 
and said that if this fellow was so clumsy, he might have nothing to live for, and he could quickly deal with him if his friends didn't have the courage to do it. The bandit said that they shouldn't do this, this kid might still be useful to them. At this moment the boy tried to get to his feet, but the guy who was shielding him in front of Tom sharply swung his leg back and hit him right in the head. The blows sent the boy flying a few meters away from Tom, and the bandit said that he would make sure that Tom never saw him as a messenger again. Tom began to smile and wave his knife, expressing denial. He asked to send this little guy to him one more time, and then he would definitely be able to count how many bones there were in his little body. Tom grinned at the boy with all his teeth and warned him that this would not be their last meeting. The girls stood a little to the side. Tom looked at them and said that they had nothing to fear. He was always happy with these two, and they can come to visit him even without an invitation. The bandit said that they would return for them tomorrow at the same time. Tom tapped the snowmobile with a knife and offered to send them on his own tomorrow if they left him one snowmobile. The bandit said that they couldn't do that, because they could get into trouble if these girls took a wrong turn. The old man grinned and said that he would try to finish with them quickly, after which he disappeared into the darkness of the building. At that moment, a boy with a sword in his leg stood up from the snow. His name was Scott. Scott got up and asked what it was all about. But he didn't even have time to fully finish his sentence when the bandit grabbed him by the mouth and ordered him to shut up. He threatened that if Scott ever opened his mouth again without his permission, he would be immediately demoted to a slave. Scott said through clenched teeth that he understood everything and apologized. The bandit abruptly released him and threw him into the snow. Within a few minutes, everyone was distributed on snowmobiles and went to their base. Meanwhile, the girls and Tom went into his room. They understood perfectly well what they would have to do now, although not one of them wanted it. But they had absolutely no choice, and they were already accustomed to the fact that in the gang they were used simply for carnal pleasures and sometimes they paid for it so for the purchase of any goods. Tom was filled with a feeling of excitement. He liked it when girls were defenseless and unquestioningly followed his orders. He pointed his finger at Amanda and ordered her to come closer to him. Pointing the knife at the second one, he ordered her to go to the second floor and cut some meat with it. Amanda had been to Tom more than once and began to whisper to Becca what she should do. However, Tom quickly approached them and asked what they were doing here. They came here together to please each other. He put a knife in Amanda's hands and said that if his mood was spoiled today, then someone would have to bear responsibility for it. Tom looked at Amanda, who clearly understood what his words meant. She was afraid to move and quietly said that he was certainly right. Tom pushed Amanda away and ordered her to go to the second floor and cut up the meat. Afterwards, he told her that he would get up soon and she shouldn't miss him. He turned around and looked at Becca who was confused and didn't know what she could expect from him. Tom beckoned her with his finger, but she did not come up, but grabbed her fingers tightly into the table, and out of fear she simply could not tear them away from the table. Even when they were driving here in the car, Amanda warned Becca that under no circumstances should she contradict him. It's best to just free your thoughts and imagine yourself as a zombie who will do whatever he's told. Resistance turns him on even more, and if she doesn't react in any way, he'll leave sooner. At that moment, Becca simply listened silently to her friend, but did not even imagine what awaited her. Tom roughly grabbed her by the hair, turned her back to him and forced her head into the table. This made the girl cry out in pain, and Tom pressed himself against her buttocks. He leaned over her and began to smell her. He whispered quietly in her ear that he had only smelled the smell of meat for a month. But when he inhales the scent of a young girl, he simply enjoys it. With a huge smile on his face, he said that he really wanted to kill her. At this time, the bandits were driving to the base. Scott was unhappy with the situation. He turned to Henry and said that he did everything he was told to do. But if he continued to be beaten and humiliated in front of the slave's eyes, then in the future they would not take him seriously at all. These dogs won't even listen then. Before he had time to finish this, a new blow from Henry landed on his nose. Scott immediately coughed and grabbed his face with both hands. The driver asked not to fill his car with blood, because it would be difficult to clean it later. The driver threw a napkin at Scott, and said that even if he received one badge, this does not mean at all that he can now go where he doesn't need to go. Henry hovered over Scott, and asked him to listen carefully. Once upon a time, the bastard Tom was a policeman, and with a very bad character. But Tom was not just a policeman, he caught not only criminals, he also kept all ordinary people in fear. 
he was famous for his cruelty to everyone who surrounded him. If he doesn't like a person's appearance, then something will happen to him, so he was exiled to the provinces. However, in the village he began to drink a lot, and one day he massacred the entire village, then the number of those killed exceeded 30 people. In general he went completely crazy, it's better not to touch this mad dog, he's a real psycho. Scott wiped the blood coming from his nose and asked if Tom was such a psychopath, then why haven't they killed him yet? Henry said that a more correct question here is why they still haven't killed him, continue to make deals and sometimes even grovel, as happened now. The answer to this question is very simple, he is a real zombie killer. Here in the vicinity of Seoul there are three legendary psychos, as there are rumors in the basements of the prison, there is a surviving group of prisoners. It was rumored that these three had already caught hundreds of thousands of zombies. If you listen to those who climb to them from the lower regions, you can hear from them stories about how the snow begins to melt and zombies come out from under the snow to hunt in whole flocks. And here you don't need to think for long. Soon hordes of zombies will rush up straight for food. Seoul is their final destination one way or another. And Tom, even though he's crazy, even though he's a murderer, if he helps defend the city from zombies, then they can only thank him. So tomorrow, when they go to pick up the girls, there's no point in even breathing in Tom's direction. You just need to silently pick up the girls and leave. Scott understood everything and apologized to Henry. Henry said that Scott doesn't bother him. He's worried about Tom, from whom you can expect anything. He's as kind as he is today only when he's killing. A new day arrived, and the guys were driving to Tom's house to pick up the girls. They drove closer and closer and saw two silhouettes standing on the street. The girls had been standing on the street for several hours. They didn't know where to go, but they didn't want to go back to Tom, even if it cost them their lives. Becky's hand was all cut up with a knife. This complete psycho took up his task again. He couldn't just enjoy the girl. He was turned on by screams, torment, and bullying. All this time, Mason spent the night on the ship and watched what was happening. Now he was more prepared for the sudden appearance of people or zombies. He hung bells around the entire perimeter. A rope with bells hung both at the entrance and in the elevator shaft. Everything around was quite quiet, and there were no signs of trouble. However, the peace did not last as long as we would have liked. Zombies with red eyes were advancing in droves. Bells were ringing everywhere. One by one they made sounds of approaching danger. But Mason was fast asleep. He did not hear any of them. No one had attacked him in the middle of the night for a long time, especially since the last two nights passed quite calmly, and it seemed that the ship was completely empty. He slept soundly and quietly chanted the words that, in secret from others, he wandered, shedding tears. Mason dreamed of his military base called Eagle. Mason was a tank driver, and his rank was sergeant. When he arrived again from his next training trip, the lieutenant asked him about his date with the girl today. The lieutenant told Mason that his girlfriend was already in the waiting room and couldn't wait for him. Mason thanked the lieutenant for the information and quickly began to get ready to see his girlfriend. Five minutes later he reached the meeting room. His girlfriend did not behave as usual. She sat stiffly and was not at all happy about their conversation. She said that she would no longer come to him. Mason looked at her in surprise and did not understand why she was doing this. What happened? She couldn't find the right and right words. She said that she had wanted to tell him for a long time, but couldn't bring herself to do it. She was afraid to upset him, because now he is not having the easiest time until he reaches the rank of corporal. And because of this, many people take up arms and, God forbid, desert. She didn't even look at him, and said it as if to the floor. Mason said with a smile that he doesn't shoot a pistol, he's a tanker. The girl looked into his eyes with hope and asked if he could understand her. Mason, without losing his composure, said that everything was clear here. Let everyone live their own lives. The girl immediately supported him and said that he had always been like this. He didn't need anything. That's probably why they should break up. Mason began to adjust his cap and asked her not to start making this conversation worse. And if they were to break up, then perhaps they should break up on a good note. She quickly stood up and thanked him for his time with a smile. Then she slowly began to leave the room. Mason, without turning around, quietly said thank you to you too. But the girl returned and asked him to fulfill another request of hers. Mason was surprised to ask what exactly she wanted from him. Finally, she asked him to touch his head one last time. Mason said that although he is not in the mood for this, but if she really wants it, then he is not against it. She put her hand to his head, 
and she began to experience unusual sensations. He felt her touch as if in reality. It was completely unusual for a dream. The zombie's hand was already reaching his head. Mason slowly opened his eyes. The zombies were already at arm's length from him. One of them was able to grab his jacket and held it tightly without letting go. And at that moment Mason was able to get up and grab his machine gun. He was very lucky. The wiring prevented the zombies from reaching him and turning him into one of their kind. Mason was sitting on a booth, and zombies were rushing towards him. The zombies made him wake up very quickly, but he did not understand how this was possible, because he checked everything. He couldn't even imagine where these creatures had come from. He didn't know what to do, because this was his escape route. There were a lot of zombies, and they began to break through the ceiling. They all acted together, as if they were a single organism. This behavior was very strange, because usually they were attracted by noise or light. But here there was either one nor the other. Mason couldn't understand how so many zombies came here together, and why their eyes glow bright red. They fell from the ceiling and fell to the bottom of the toilet. Mason looked down in order to analyze the situation and understand whether they were alive. How surprised he was when he saw that they not only did not die, but also began to crawl towards him through the booths. There were a lot of them, and they were already one step away from tearing Mason apart. He aimed his machine gun at them, but did not understand at all what to do. And at that moment, when one of the zombies had already begun to climb onto his cabin, he looked at the ventilation from where they came. Since they all fell down, it means there should no longer be more than one zombie there. Unless there are zombies near the emergency ventilation exit, he will be able to get out into the guest hall. When the theoretical plan had already been developed, all that remained was to get there. Mason ran without thinking for a long time. Having run fast enough, he jumped into the ventilation shaft. This was his only escape route. Flying over a horde of zombies, he managed to jump over and land right in the ventilation. But there, two zombies, slowly and quietly descending like spiders, were waiting for him. Mason thought only about one thing, that he would be able to survive. Quickly reaching the guest lounge, he looked down and there didn't seem to be more than one zombie there. However, behind him he heard a growl that did not stop and was approaching. There was no choice and he jumped from the ventilation into the guest hall. The floor there was not very strong, and he began to slide down at great speed, at the same time trying to aim at the zombies approaching him. At some point he broke the glass of the ship with his back and now began to roll down the stern of the ship. He fell into the snow and began to aim at the window, from which came the terrible growling of the vile dead. It was very cold outside, but due to the rush of adrenaline and fear that filled Mason from his toes to his head, so far he did not feel the cold at all. Suddenly he heard a crash under his feet. From under the ice a dead cold hand grabbed his leg. Another drowned zombie, whose eyes glowed red, just like the zombies from the ship. Mason looked closely and realized that huge hordes of drowned zombies were also raging under the ice, their path blocked only by solid water. For a second he remembered his friend Max, the one with whom he had wandered together for a long time around the frozen world before that tragic moment with the melted ice. The second hand came out right from under the snow and grabbed Mason's leg. This zombie looked a lot like Max. Could it really be him? Using his clothes, he climbed higher and higher on Mason, and he became numb and could not move. Max told him why he abandoned him then, left him alone to die, and did not deprive him of this terrible fate. Without ceasing, he asked why he did this to him. Why? From behind, Someone called out to Mason and asked him to come to his senses. Mason shook his head and realized that he was just imagining it. All the zombies continued to be under the ice. Behind Mason there was a man who was piercing the ice with a long harpoon. He said that in such conditions one should not lose vigilance, even though there is only a hand on the surface. But if you grab it, it is very difficult to tear it off. Mason was glad that there was at least someone alive here. The man turned to him and said that he should only beware of those zombies with bright red eyes, because they are very thoughtful and extremely dangerous guys. The man said that the ice had not melted yet, he was cutting off their hands and heads, a kind of farming. Mason apologized and said that he did not know the local customs, he came from far away, and fell upon him out of the blue. The man began to take off his hat and scarf from his face, saying that there was nothing to apologize to him for. He continued to harpoon through the ice and zombie heads. The man said that, apparently, Mason needed somewhere to warm up, and he could offer to spend the night with him. 
He finally took off his mask and he can also offer you a cup of coffee. Mason looked at the man and realized that this was exactly the man he had been watching all these days. Tom introduced himself and said that he managed to get some very good coffee. He pointed his finger where to go and waited for an answer from Mason. The cold gradually began to penetrate Mason's body. Tom looked at him and assumed that he was running away in what he had. He was probably caught by surprise, even if he had to leave his clothes. Mason scratched his head and said that he really was in trouble. Tom asked with interest if Mason had any other things that were worth coming back for. Mason, without thinking for a long time, said that old clothes were all he had. Then it's not worth risking your life for this. Tom said that he has a lot of old clothes at home, and they can pick them up for Mason. Meanwhile, Mason's things were in the closet, including a machine gun hidden in his things. However, Mason thought that it was not worth talking about it right away. It would be better if it remained his little secret. Mason was now only thinking that the stranger was no less dangerous than those zombies who almost ate him half an hour ago. They quickly came to Tom's house. Tom showed Mason where to sit. It was a little warmer there than in other places in the dilapidated apartment. Before Mason had time to sit down, Tom threw him a jacket. Tom started making coffee and asked Mason how he managed to survive in such chaos. To which Mason replied that he was very cowardly, so he was able to avoid trouble. Tom asked him if there was anyone else with him, or if he had been traveling alone from the very beginning. Mason had already put on his jacket and put his machine gun on his hands. He said that his partner died a few years ago, and since then he has been traveling alone. The world is big, there are a lot of zombies everywhere, and he just had to always be careful, which is why he is still alive. Tom was making coffee and said that he most likely understood what kind of person Mason was. Mason became interested and asked Tom what he meant. Tom, without turning around, said that Mason was tiring. You turn the words of adults around. You don't listen to others. In general you are a person with a bad character. Mason didn't immediately understand what was going on. But he immediately apologized if Tom thought he was rude. He didn't want to offend or offend him. Tom walked up to him with a cup of coffee and said with a smile on his face that he was just joking. Mason grabbed the cup with both hands and said that he really could have been rude, because he hadn't talked to anyone for so long, and he simply could have forgotten what it was. Mason remembered Tom's words about being careful of red eyes, what he meant. Tom asked in surprise if this was the first time he had seen a zombie with red eyes. Mason said that in the places where he had been, all the zombies had ordinary eyes, or there were none at all. Tom didn't even believe him right away. Were there really red-eyed zombies anywhere else? Mason nodded his head and said that this was the first time he had seen such zombies in Seoul. Tom thought about it because it was quite strange, but most likely Mason was just lucky. But since he is so interested in learning about red-eyed zombies, Mason, without waiting for an answer, said that he was just incredibly interested in learning more about them. But Tom scratched his head and said that maybe he shouldn't reveal such first-class information to a fool. Mason looked at Tom with pleading eyes and said that he would be very grateful for such important information. Tom liked how Mason reacted and said that such a nice boy could reveal this secret. Tom asked him to listen carefully and not interrupt, because this area used to be a zombie world. But even so, Tom said that he really wanted to get this hotel, and he is the kind of guy who gets what he wants. He gritted his teeth and killed every last one of them. However, on the subway he had the opportunity to meet this creature for the first time in his life. The zombie stood alone on the very edge of the platform, and his eyes glowed bright red, which distinguished him from all those whom he killed that day. Then I didn't suspect anything wrong. He killed hundreds of zombies every day, and this one seemed like another obstacle to a carefree life. However, when he began to walk towards the zombie, the creature began to slowly move back. He asked Mason if he had ever seen a zombie back away at the sight of a person, to which Mason responded with surprise that he had never seen such a thing before. At that moment, when the creature began to gradually retreat, a whole herd of goosebumps ran from the tailbone to the back of the head. Over the many years of the zombie apocalypse, my senses are developing more than ever, so I stopped and thought that I shouldn't follow the creature's lead. I started to step back a little. I stepped back and looked around. In the doorway I saw whole hordes of red-eyed creatures looking at me from the darkness. These creatures waited until I went beyond a certain line. Mason asked if these zombies were really hunting in a pack. Tom said he didn't know what they were doing, but they were clearly wiser than the average dumb zombies that wander around the world aimlessly. 
Tom said that even though he was running very fast, he still felt cold on his back. Just at that moment his gaze fell on the mirror in front. These creatures behind simply stood and terribly looked at the back, not even trying to pursue. Tom said that for the first time in his life he was so scared. And now you just need to think about what would have happened if I had gone in to kill that creature. I probably wouldn't drink coffee here, Mason concluded. Tom poured coffee into his glass and said that his hunches rarely let him down. Tom walked up to the table where Mason was sitting and asked him if he was letting go of his machine gun. It's probably just hard to trust people after so many years of loneliness. Mason looked at his machine gun and said that he felt somehow calmer with a weapon in his hands. After all, unarmed people have no choice but to trust those people who have weapons in their hands. Tom said that Mason is completely right, but armed people are not always good. Tom stood over Mason and asked him if he was good. Mason said that he couldn't say for sure. Mason said he tried to live his life trying not to hurt other people. Mason decided to change the subject and said that this coffee has a very pleasant aroma. Tom agreed with him because the past immediately comes to mind, the times when we lived well and ate well. Mason looked at the cup of coffee and said that it seemed to him that if he blinked now, he would be at home in the living room watching TV, the familiar calming aroma. Yes, those were good times. Just a cup of coffee, and we are already deeply immersed in the past. Tom addressed Mason in a personal manner, and he said that he shouldn't do that, because Tom is clearly quite more experienced than him. Tom said that everyone has their own time in one way or another, and the way they address each other is absolutely nothing means in the current world. Tom went to his locker and took out flashlights. He asked Mason if he wasn't interested in how he managed to survive. If anything, by going down he could get the answer to this fascinating question. Tom said he makes awesome stuff. They are very popular among the survivors, and Mason may be very surprised when he sees them. Tom beckoned him with his hand and said it wouldn't take long. Mason was in no hurry to agree. He looked at the table and saw two imprints from cups on it. Then he looked down into the basement again. Mason suspected something was wrong and quickly said that he was very tired and would like to get some sleep first. He apologized to Tom because he has all his heart for him. Tom turned around and said that it was okay. No need for an apology. We could go later. After that, they went to the upper floors of the hotel. Tom walked ahead and Mason still held the weapon in his hands and was ready to use it at any moment. Mason looked down. It was quite high. Tom said that it was very dark here. Just one mistake and you could go straight to the next world. Mason said that he is used to such darkness, and he always walks with extreme caution. Then we'll part ways here, Tom said. He suggested that Mason go up the stairs to the floor above. There were many empty rooms there, and he could occupy any of them. Mason thanked Tom for taking care of him today. Tom said that it was nothing, and if they were lucky tonight, they would see each other alive tomorrow. As soon as they parted, Mason removed his left hand from the machine gun and found that it was sweating a lot, and everything inside him tightened. Still, new acquaintances are not so easy. Mason entered the first room he came across. The glass was broken, and it could hardly be called a room at all. Mason went to the window and took a closer look. There was a light in the distance. When Mason was standing near the window below, Tom shouted to him that before he lit the fire, he should fix the curtains. The fire would be of no use if the cold entered the room. Mason asked Tom if it was possible to light a fire here, to which he received an answer that there was no need to worry about it. It was quite safe here. Then Mason got to work and began fixing the curtains, after which he began to collect fire sticks lying around the room. The trouble is, he has either a lighter nor matches. He took a stick with him and decided to ask Tom for some fire hoping that he would not refuse it. Mason went to the door and knocked. Tom carefully opened the door and asked what else he needed. Mason handed him a stick and asked him to borrow at least a little light. The old man looked at him with displeasure, but still took the stick and went deeper into the room. Mason decided to look into the room while he was setting a stick on fire for him. It was as if there was something in the bathroom. Mason couldn't see what was there when Tom appeared. He handed him a stick with fire and said that he could repay him with more fire. With a burning stick, Mason headed to his room. The fire was already burning full blast in Mason's fireplace. He laid down next to the fire and covered himself with a carpet. After everything he had experienced that day, he urgently needed to warm up a little, because few people can constantly be in the cold and not get sick. At the same time, a girl was moving in the distance through snow-covered snowdrifts and a dark forest. 
the cold penetrated her body to the bones. Although she was wrapped in several things, this did not greatly save her from the constantly falling snow, darkness, and dead cold. Our Father who art in heaven, let your name shine, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, just as we forgive our debtors. Don't lead us into your temptation, but deliver us from evil, where your kingdom is power and glory, and forever and ever. Amen. This happened a long time ago. The plane was rapidly losing altitude, and they were approaching the ground at great speed. Melinda was one of the passengers on this plane. One of the engines on the plane was on fire, and a crash was inevitable. Melinda understood this very well. She quickly took out her phone and started texting her mother. Mom immediately answered her that she simply had to survive in any way. She would always be waiting for her at the specified address. She tried to call her mother, but the network was not available. At that moment, meteorites began to fly near the plane. The sister grabbed Melinda's hand. She was very scared that they would break. Melinda tried to calm her sister down and said that everything would work out for them. However, they were flying over the sea and meteorites were flying near their plane one after another, so the burning engine was not their biggest problem. The plane crashed, but the mother wrote to her daughter that after landing she should inject herself with the L1 vaccine. The directions for use are written on the bottle. Several years have passed. The survivors of the crash meet strangers on their way. One of them introduces himself as a pastor, and tells them that he is the leader of a group of survivors. Their group is called Silent Prayer. Melinda said that they were heading to Seoul, the pastor said that he could help them. They could warm up and replenish their strength in their shelter, after which they agreed to follow him. The survivors from the pastor's team were glad that they were able to meet such young girls. One of the pastor's people asked if Melinda was in a women's musical group. A couple of years ago it would have been difficult for ordinary people to see her. The pastor said that God really smiled on them. If not God, then who prepared such a wonderful meeting for them? By that time they had already approached the church. The pastor was opening the entrance, and at that moment Melinda saw a tattoo on his leg. Such tattoos are worn by members of criminal gangs. This seriously confused Melinda. Something was clearly wrong here. The pastor opened the entrance to the church and asked everyone to enter. They walked along the dark corridor of the church and had almost entered the main hall. The pastor asked them not to be shy and get to know the followers of the church. Rejoice, brothers and sisters. The pastor said that he plans to get married and propose his hand and heart to the newly arrived Melinda. The bandit said that everyone should get a little bit of it. Otherwise it's not serious. He wanted to take it all for himself at once. One of the bandits said that if he is called a shepherd, this does not mean that he has ceased to be mortal. The bespectacled bandit said that you shouldn't be so greedy. And once they specifically agreed that if they find something valuable together, then everyone should get something good. The old bandit supported... The loot should be divided among everyone and everyone should try it. At his age there was only melancholy all around. The pastor smiled and said that if the majority was of this opinion, he would not interfere. Then first we need to let her go in a circle. The door to their room was slightly open. Melinda stood at the door and perfectly heard the bandits discussing her future fate. She immediately ran to her sister. Melinda said that she should not be afraid of anything and should listen to her very carefully. It seems these people are not real shepherds. She held her sister by the shoulders and said that these are very scary people. Therefore, first they need to quickly get out of there. But the sister immediately asked what would happen next. If they managed to escape, then where should they go next? The girl didn't believe Melinda. She said that if they ran away, they might freeze to death on the street. Melinda said that until this time they had managed to survive. And now they will succeed. By any means they must get to Seoul and their mother will be waiting for them there. The girl was still wary of Melanie's words. She was very scared even without her words. Melinda said they had to do what they had to do one way or another. The girl said that the director constantly repeated these words. Melinda confirmed that the principal said such nonsense all the time, but these words were more appropriate for this moment than ever. She took the girl by the hand and rushed to the exit. The other survivors looked at Melinda and her sister and did not understand why they were leaving. The man suggested that something was wrong here, and most likely the girls knew something, so they should go with them. One of the survivors ran towards the exit and even pushed Melinda away. From the very beginning, the presence of zombies sitting in the church was suspicious. A zombie tied with chains could still move. At that moment, when a woman ran past him, he attacked her, biting straight into her neck. 
Immediately, several zombies sitting nearby attacked her and began to tear her to pieces. Behind them, the pastor laughed. The pastor ordered everyone to remain in their seats. The oldest bandit looked out of the room and said that they shouldn't have moved without permission. It was he who released the zombie from the chain so that he could reach the woman and kill her. The pastor ordered the men to stand on his right side and the women on his left. One of the men asked what they were going to do with him. One of the bandits did not like that the guy was asking unnecessary questions, after which he was immediately followed by a direct kick to the stomach, with an exclamation to move faster. From the blow, the guy flew straight into the clutches of the zombies. The bandit laughed and apologized for such a strong blow to the guy who had already been devoured by zombies. The pastor asked not to do this again. They need to save their workforce. Everyone around was horrified by what had happened, and the pastor reminded them that they needed to quickly follow orders. Everyone looked at the pastor with horror in their eyes. After this, the pastor ordered one bag to be distributed to everyone. The bandit threw the bags on the floor and ordered them to be sorted quickly. Everyone should take one bag and go outside and start collecting. One of the women asked what this meant, because it was cold and snowing outside. Now the meaning of collecting is a little different than before. They should collect items for the household, some products that everyone will need. But the woman said that everything outside was covered with snow, where she could get useful items. The shepherd said that at the moment they are all just useless worms for their community. And how dare she even say such a thing? She looked at the zombie, who was ready to attack her. Then she instantly decided that she would definitely be able to bring something needed for the community. It's better that way, and let no one even think about returning empty-handed, unless, of course, they want to join the ranks of domestic zombies. First of all, they should collect food and other essential items. But Melinda and her sister should give them a minute for a private conversation. The bandits were already looking forward to the upcoming sexual fun with these young beauties. The girls were terrified. Each of them at that moment would like to be in the place of the others and engage in collecting, and not what they had to do. The shepherd suddenly turned around and looked at the rest of the people who had come with Melinda and her sister. He ordered them to quickly go in search of supplies. But the women began to talk in horror that they had only recently come in from the cold. The shepherd pointed to his dog sleeping under the bench and said that for their disobedience they go to work twice. If someone wants to run away or does not bring anything useful, then their bodies will still benefit the community in the form of dog food. Submission and humiliation of people brought the shepherd boundless pleasure from which he never stopped smiling for a second. The fear, helplessness, and despair that he saw in their eyes only inspired him more and more. He turned again and looked at Melinda and her sister, who were looking at him with no less horror than the others, not knowing what awaited them ahead. The shepherd said that in addition to his four friends, there are now eight more workers in the temple. Wait, not eight workers, but six workers and two beautiful ladies. The shepherd said that a special assignment had been prepared for them. Melinda, through tears, asked what they wanted from them. The shepherd smiled even wider and said that this was a special assignment for especially valuable workers. He approached the girls sitting on the floor, leaned close and said that now the two of them were a real symbol of this place. Now they are two sweet wives of these wonderful four men. Melinda understood perfectly well what they wanted from them and what the bandits were trying to achieve, but this made her no less scared. The shepherd said that the two of them should be obedient wives. From that day on they should fulfill any of their demands. One of the bandits said that in between pleasures he wanted them to sing and dance like they did in the past. The shepherd stood up straight again and said that it was time to get down to the main thing. He pointed his finger at Melinda's sister and ordered the other bandits to take care of her. The bandits began to laugh ominously, imagining all those terrible sexual abuses for defenseless girls. The girl grabbed Melinda tightly and began screaming and asking her sister to somehow help her. Three large men easily snatched the fragile young girl from Melinda's arms. The screams did not stop, which woke up the dogs, and the loud ominous barking of the guard dogs was added to them. But no one could stop these animals, thanks to the virus around this chapel. No one could hear these pleas for help. It had long been very difficult to meet a living person on the street. Several hours passed after this. The naked shepherd danced joyfully in his room and hummed a song. He turned around and said that he had done this to women many times before. But according to his personal feelings, Melinda was the best. He couldn't even describe the full range of emotions in words, but it was excellent. He had not had such a delightful mood for a long time. He took a cigarette out of the pack and said that recently he had really become a real believer. 
those who managed to survive, very smart people, in the country, about 90% of the population died or turned into zombies. He lit a cigarette and said that in the religious prison in which he had been kept for many years, everything was the opposite. About 90% of the prisoners survived and are healthy to this day. He laughed loudly. How could it be that all those who were facing the death penalty survived, while everyone else died like flies? The shepherd knew for sure that all the most sinister criminals survived, which means God is protecting them. Otherwise, how could they survive so easily? After these words, he laughed out loud again. How glad he was. Most likely the outstanding judge who sentenced him was also already a corpse. Melinda lay behind him, covering her head with a blanket, and did not stop trembling. The shepherd turned to her and menacingly asked if she believed in God. Melinda lay silently and was afraid to move. Then the shepherd came up to the bedside table and said that she was completely right. What kind of conversations can there be when it's high time to get down to business? However, first, like a real shepherd, he must thank Melinda for giving him such a wonderful mood. He took out an inkwell with thick black paint. Approaching the stove, he poured paint into a small container, which was intended for heating liquids. When the paint began to boil, he dipped a small metal pencil into it. The shepherd said that from today, Melinda's life will change. He approached her and said that every time she brings him pleasure, he will leave a mark on her with the words well done. The shepherd abruptly grabbed her hand sticking out from under the blanket and pulled it towards him. He turned his hand palm up and asked Melinda how many marks he should leave on it today. He slammed burning paint into Melinda's palm, causing her to scream and try to pull her hand away from the monster's strong grip. Her screams excited the shepherd even more. With his other hand he grabbed the blanket that covered the girl's naked body. He abruptly tore the blanket off the girl and said that it was high time to get rid of this blanket, which greatly interfered with their relationship. Fragile and defenseless Melinda could not resist a large, well-developed man. She couldn't stop shaking and crying. Just a few years ago she couldn't have imagined that she would find herself in such a situation and be so defenseless. The shepherd laughed and held her hand tightly, waiting for the paint to be well absorbed under her skin. Other bandits also quietly peeked out from behind the door, waiting for the shepherd to finish with her and leave Melinda to the other bandits. She saw them peeking from behind the door and understood perfectly well that she would never be able to forget this church again. Having replayed these terrifying memories in her head, she looked at her hand, which was covered with tattoos made by the shepherd. The cold winter wind that penetrated her entire body did not stop covering her with snow, but Melinda did not stop looking at her hand. A minute later, she clenched her hand into a fist and thought that everything terrible was over. She is no longer the fragile and defenseless girl she was several years ago. Now she is a real warrior who is ready to overcome any challenge in order to achieve her goal. She continued to walk through the snow and asked the Lord to save her from this hell. A dilapidated building that belonged to Tom could already be seen ahead. Meanwhile, in the room where Mason was staying it had already become a little warmer and only the crackling of the fire could be heard. Tom watched from outside the room. He had long wanted to kill Mason, but the machine gun, which Mason never parted with for a second, did not make him as decisive as he would have liked. Tom only saw a machine gun sticking out from under the carpet. But Mason was not visible. Most likely he was cold and trying to warm up. Tom continued to quietly stand at the door and watch Mason. After standing like that for a while, Tom scratched the back of his head with a knife because he didn't notice anything suspicious. Deciding that there was nothing to worry about, Tom stopped his observation and went to do his favorite thing. But everything was not as simple as it seemed to him from the outside. Mason sat in the corner of the room and watched. The fact that Tom came here and watched him was not just like that. He either wanted to attack or was assessing the situation. After sitting in the cold for a long time, Mason's body moved much slower than usual. He slowly got to his feet and warmed up a little. First, he needed to find out if he could trust Tom and what he wanted to show him in the basement. Mason moved around the building as quietly as possible. Unlike Tom, who walked around his house boldly, freely and correspondingly loudly. Going down to the basement, Tom stopped abruptly. It seemed to him that someone was watching him. He turned sharply and shone his flashlight at the top of the stairs. But there was no one and nothing behind him. Everything was as always. Tom grinned and put the lantern away. He yawned and thought it was just his imagination, given that it was very late at night. Masson, meanwhile, stood outside the door and practically did not breathe, so as not to give himself away. 
When Tom put the flashlight away, Mason exhaled with relief and relaxed a little. However, it became clear to him that if Tom was so wary of the slightest rustle, then he definitely had something to hide. Tom went into the basement through the plastic wrap and began asking his pigs if they were eating well. Tom put on his apron and gloves, which he always had ready and intended for cutting meat, while the pigs squealed loudly as they took food from each other. Tom said that he gives them well-processed meat, but if they still can't eat it, then he will have to open up a dozen carcasses and throw them out into the street. While cutting up a pork carcass, he said that this probably shouldn't be done, because zombies would come running to the smell of fresh meat. At that moment, Mason had already gone down and watched what was happening, but he was surprised where Tom got so much food to support a dozen fat pigs on his own. He opened the plastic curtain a little and took a closer look at what the pigs were eating so quickly and deliciously. When he saw this, he lost his mind for a few seconds. Altogether the pigs ate the human body piece by piece. Everything around was covered in blood, but the pigs were so hungry that they didn't even pay any attention to Mason. When the realization of what was happening came to him, he could barely restrain his vomiting, which was rolling stronger and stronger from his stomach. Tom continued to cut up the pig carcass, and due to the loud eating of the pigs, he did not suspect anything. He calmly continued to do his favorite thing, quietly humming a song he had invented. Mason quietly and quickly climbed the stairs, continuing to hold back the urge to vomit. When he climbed the stairs he began to breathe calmly, leaving vomit in his stomach, but he could not even imagine that he would see something like that. Mason thought that he should get out of here as quickly as possible. Now he was sure that the people who came here last time went to feed the pigs. It was a real hell on earth. Mason had already climbed several floors higher, but what he saw haunted his stomach, and he had to quickly come to his senses. However, before leaving this damned place, he decided to quickly look into Tom's room, because he definitely saw something moving in the bathroom and this was the perfect moment to check his guess. When he opened the door it creaked a little. He entered the room and began to examine it. There was a smell of food all around. Near Tom's bed he saw several open tin cans. There was also a good military knife there. At first Mason wanted to take it for himself, but then I thought that Tom would definitely notice this loss, and he also had knives that he could use after discovering the loss. Suddenly, something began to gurgle in the bathroom. Mason began to tiptoe towards the bathroom. He definitely saw that something was moving here in the bathroom, so he looked there very carefully, being careful of an attack. There were many empty and half-full bottles of detergent scattered around the bathtub. They were everywhere, and the bathroom was most likely filled with this product. But why does Tom need all this? Why does he need so much money? After everything he saw, Mason clearly understood that Tom was clearly not fighting germs here. He took a stick standing on the floor which was clearly intended for stirring, and began this task. After stirring the thick liquid from it a little, zombie heads immediately began to float up. Seeing this, Mason jumped back in horror. The heads were still alive and made growling sounds. He's probably disinfecting the zombies and detergents so he can make canned food out of them. Unexpectedly, Mason heard footsteps on the other side of the door. This was immediately followed by the creaking of the door. Tom entered his room with a huge knife. He immediately noticed an unusual smell and then shined his flashlight on the floor. But the wet footprints of Mason's bare feet were clearly visible on the floor. There was more than a lot of evidence of his presence in the room. The tracks led first to the bathroom, then to the window. At that moment, Mason was slowly crawling out of the window, but there were negligible options for a safe transition to the lower floor. The wall was smooth from icing and very slippery. There was nothing left to do but jump down. Mason looked down. The ground was completely covered with snow. He thought that he might be able to avoid breaking when falling, although he certainly had no choice. With the words everything will be fine, Mason pushed off the wall with his feet and flew down like a stone with great speed. As expected, he landed in a soft layer of snow that had just fallen. Tom had just gone to his window and looked down. He asked Mason if he survived the fall, and also noticed that Mason was a very nimble guy. But Tom even liked it. Finally he would be able to hunt for real and not kill stupid people in his basement who so easily agreed to go along with his cunning tricks. Mason lay in the snow and thought about how lucky he was that he didn't die from the fall, and on the other hand, he wasn't very lucky to screw up like that in front of Tom. Now he'll definitely want to kill him, but now there's no machine gun nearby, and now Tom has a clear advantage. Cold, hunger and fatigue overwhelmed Mason, 
but now was not the right time to give up. He stood up and thought that if he moved quickly he might be able to get back to his room. After a few seconds of running through the snow, Mason was already entering the building. He quietly closed the door behind him. It seemed like Tom was nowhere to be found. Mason even breathed a sigh of relief. But suddenly Tom's voice was heard from the darkness, who quietly asked Mason where he had been going. Mason didn't know what to answer and slowly turned to face Tom. As soon as Mason wanted to say something, Tom immediately interrupted him and, with a smile on his face, asked where he could go so late and in such cold weather. Out of habit, Mason wanted to take the machine gun hanging behind his back. But it wasn't there. Tom saw all his movements perfectly and laughed. Without ceasing to laugh, Tom asked where Mason lost his machine gun, which he could not part with for so long. After a few seconds, Tom stopped laughing and showed his huge knife from behind his back. Suddenly, a loud knock was heard from the other side. Mason understood perfectly well that although Tom was laughing, he clearly wanted to kill him. The knocking on the door continued even more persistently. Tom didn't pay attention to the knock on the door. His attention was completely attracted to a new piece of meat named Mason. He said that even from there he could hear the gears turning in Mason's head. Two more huge knives were sticking out from behind Tom's back. The knocking on the door continued. The situation around was so tense that Mason even managed to warm up from the huge amount of adrenaline that suddenly entered his blood. Tom asked where Mason lost his machine gun. Did he really leave it in the room this time? Mason couldn't think of anything and how he could justify himself to Tom. The only correct solution that came to his mind was the option of quickly running up the stairs. The snow was quickly melting and drops were running down Mason's face. He thought that he now had no choice. He had to fight for his life if he wanted to live. The knocking on the door stopped, and it began to slowly open. When the door opened completely, Mason thought that this was his chance, and abruptly rushed towards the stairs. At the same moment, a huge knife was stuck into the wall right in front of his face. Tom, although he was a little old, had not lost his speed and knew how to handle knives professionally. Throwing the knife, he said that if Mason took one more step, he would cut him into pieces like a pig right here. This frightened Mason even more, and he stood still, afraid to move. At this tense moment, Melinda entered the building and immediately apologized for the disturbance. She was very cold, which is why she moved slowly and her speech was unhurried. Immediately after apologizing, she asked for help. Masson, like Tom, did not expect her arrival, but if not for her appearance here and now, Mason might already be dead. Tom couldn't believe his eyes, Melinda's appearance clouded his mind. Mason looked at Tom again and noticed that he was looking at the girl. There might not be a better moment, Mason thought. This time he was not abrupt and began to slowly move towards the stairs. Silence and tension hung in the room again, and Mason, taking advantage of the situation, began to slowly move up the stairs. Tom didn't take his eyes off Melinda, and couldn't believe that this was all happening for real, he didn't even pay any attention to Mason. The girl also silently looked at Tom and waited for at least some reaction from him. He said that he could not even imagine this meeting in his dreams. Melinda stood silently, looked at him and again began to ask for help. After everything that she had to go through in the church, she thought that it could not be worse anywhere. Time has traveled several years into the past. It was Tom's prison cell, a damp, foul-smelling, rotten place. Tom sat in the lotus position and imagined freedom. A voice came from the next cell and a man asked what he was doing. Tom sharply told him to shut up and not interfere. In his thoughts he grabbed another bitch and threw her on the bed. Tom quickly moved his hand and imagined. A voice behind the wall asked how Tom was not disgusted by thinking about dead girls. The voice behind the wall confused Tom and he did not finish what he started after which he slowly stood up in order to continue the conversation with his brother in misfortune. A voice behind the wall asked if Tom remembered what day it was today. Tom touched the wall in order to feel what time it was by the heating of the wall. Tom determined from the wall that morning had already come. He asked his cellmate if he had a good dream today, to which the cellmate replied that today angels came to him from heaven. Tom laughed and said that angels could not come to such a brutal serial killer as he. Only in hell were they waiting for him. A voice behind the wall said that Tom is much younger than him, and why does he suddenly allow himself to talk to him like that? If they were together in a cell, then Tom would already be dead. A voice behind the wall told Tom not to forget, because even if he killed a hundred people, he was only in second place. Tom said he couldn't argue with that, but if he is executed today, 
Tom will be in first place. The voice behind the wall fell silent and did not answer. Tom, smiling, asked if he was offended by him, because it has always been the case that the person who lives longer comes first. The voice said that even though Tom is a bastard, this time he is definitely right. The steps of prison guards were heard in the corridor, over the years spent behind bars. Tom had perfectly learned to distinguish the steps, voices, and even breathing of prison guards. They came to the next cell. One of the guards said that everyone understood perfectly well why they came, so he should behave correctly and not play tricks. The voice said that the head of the security himself came to visit him, where such an honor came from, but asked him to be gentler, because touching a criminal can also hurt. The head of security ordered him to behave quietly. The prisoner immediately asked for a deal. He would behave quietly if he was allowed to transfer something to the next cell. Tom didn't know what his unfortunate brother wanted to convey to him. Even though they had already been in prison for many years, they had never even seen each other. The prisoner said that this was a letter that he wrote to his only neighbor before his death. The warden ordered him to show what he had in his hand. There really was just paper. Then he was allowed to give the letter to Tom. A hand with a piece of folded paper climbed into Tom's cell through the door hole. Tom leaned over incredulously and slowly took the paper. A voice behind the door said that he was giving him the last thing he had. Tom didn't know what it was and asked what kind of paper it was. The prisoner told Tom to take this paper and not deny himself anything else. The prisoner's hand was abruptly pulled out of the door, and the paper remained in Tom's hands. Tom carefully began to unfold the paper. It was unknown what could be expected from the most terrible killer who had been in this prison for many years. However, when Tom unfolded the paper, he was pleasantly surprised. It was an advertising poster with a picture of Melinda. She was once very popular and often starred in advertising. Tom was very pleased with such an unexpected gift from his neighbor, a suicide bomber. He immediately attached the poster to the wall and began stroking it with his hand. A second later, unable to contain his lustful emotions, he began to lick Melinda's face on the poster. Tom said that now Melinda is his own summer scent and he will no longer need to remember. The girl will now live with him. Now they will live together through thick and thin, Tom muttered to himself. Sweet, dear, beloved Melinda, he was sorry that she was still alive, because dead girls brought him more pleasure than living ones. Tom's thoughts went to the present time, and the same Melinda stood in front of him and asked him for help. This is the only reason why the world should continue to exist for a long time, Tom said to himself. Tom began to slowly approach Melinda with a huge knife in his hand. He missed her so much. He quickly walked up and took her by the throat. Did the summer scent really come to him on such a cold winter night? Melinda could not move. They squeezed her throat so hard, she asked who he was. Tom said that they should get to know each other better, because he had been missing her for so long. Tom continued to hold her neck, but suddenly he heard quick footsteps on the stairs. He completely forgot about Mason who had already disappeared from sight and was quickly climbing the stairs to get his machine gun. He went after Mason, telling Melinda to stand still and not dare to go or run anywhere, and only in this case could she survive. Tom said that he would now deal with that guy and immediately go down to her. He quickly ran up the stairs, but stopped on his floor. Strong black thick smoke was coming from his room. This angered Tom even more. He couldn't believe that Mason managed to set his room on fire. When he ran to the room, the fire was already blazing, even Tom's precious tent in which he slept was also burned down. A zombie's head rolled out of the room right at Tom's feet and stopped right at his feet. This was one of the heads treated in the liquid, which, although it was well cleaned with the solution, was still alive and wanted to bite Tom. Tom, with a sharp, quick movement, stepped on the zombie's head and the soft bones crunched like twigs on the ground. He stepped on the zombie's head, saying that now Mason's death is his number one task which he will accomplish no matter what. He said that now Mason's death would be special. He would cut him slowly piece by piece, starting from his feet, and continue cutting until he began to choke on his own blood. While Tom stood there he heard the door creak downstairs. He quickly began to run down the stairs. Tom said that no one has the right to touch his things. When he went downstairs the door was open and only snow and cold were blowing into the building. Tom thought only of one thing. If Mason had left the girl then maybe he would have killed him quickly. But now, he had already crossed all boundaries. He ate with him at the same table, used his shelter, they had a nice conversation, and now Mason repaid him with this. He burned down the canning room, revealed his little secret, 
And now he also took the girl who, from the moment she came to this building, became his property. Now this small piece of meat has seriously angered Tom. What does it mean it's time to start the hunt? And where could they go on a winter night in the world of the zombie apocalypse? Tom quickly threw on a warm winter jacket. He put on a hat, gloves, and a bulletproof vest. He understood perfectly well that running away in such a pursuit was not the best plan, and they definitely wouldn't be able to run far. He opened the bedside table with ski masks and said that very soon they would meet again. It was only a matter of time. Tom put on a black mask and said that his girl need not worry. Since he lost his tent today, they will have to sleep in an embrace. But a baby rat who is engaged in sabotage is better off running without stopping. There was no one in the area, and the footprints of two people were clearly visible in the snow. Tom looked at them and thought that their escape could only bring pain and disappointment. Meanwhile, Mason and Melinda had just reached a place that was familiar to him in this once huge city. Tom followed their fresh trail, not yet covered by the snow, and understood perfectly well that they were heading towards the ship. Tom thought that it was not for nothing that Mason returned to the ship infested with zombies. Most likely he hid something there. He looked at the sky. The snow was falling less and less. And this could only mean one thing. The snowstorm would end very soon and it would not be difficult to catch their trail wherever they went. The only problem for him was what Mason hid on the ship. Tom continued to walk towards the ship and the sounds of gunfire began to be heard from there. However, the shots were not ordinary. The shooting was fast and did not stop. Tom thought that if Mason did not reload his weapon when shooting, now he realized what was hidden on the ship. It was definitely a machine gun. Now the situation was not what Tom wanted. The machine gun clearly added problems to him. But he had nothing to lose, and no matter what he decided to take revenge on Mason, even if it cost him his life. At this time, the sounds of gunfire did not stop on the ship and fresh corpses of zombies were scattered everywhere. Mason stood on top of his toilet stall with a machine gun in his hands. He looked around, and there wasn't a single living zombie around. Mason turned around and looked at the booth and asked if everything was okay. A frightened Melinda looked out of the booth and said that, except for the hordes of zombies who wanted to eat them, she was fine. Making sure that everything was quiet around, Melinda descended from the booth in which she was hiding to the ground. She silently and slowly approached Mason, and he already thought that he was due gratitude for his exploits. But before he had time to rejoice, a strong woman's slap landed in his face. Mason didn't understand why she hit him, because he had saved her life twice already, the first when he saved her from the terrible killer Tom, and now when he killed a whole horde of zombies. Melinda said it was obvious, she asked for help, she wanted to get to a safe place, and he brought her to a real zombie ship. Mason said that she should also thank him, because he saved her from the bloodthirsty monster, because she did not see what was in Tom's basement. She didn't listen to him and said that before she came here, she had seen a lot, but she had never been in such a den for zombies. A rather loud argument began between them. Mason began to defend his position, and said that in that basement there are corpses of people lying, but Melinda interrupted him again asking how he could even survive if he had never seen the corpses of people. She looked Mason in the eyes and directly asked if he didn't have to kill living people to survive. But Mason stood silently and could not answer her. Although a whole mountain of zombie corpses lay behind Mason, he could not gather his thoughts and clearly answer the girl to her simple question. He apologized to her and said that he only wanted the best for her and did not want to put her in danger. He apologized again. He thought about the fact that he really brought the girl into a zombie-infested ship, where not only he, but also the girl could die. But Mason said that he was thinking first of all about how he could quickly find his machine gun in order to defend himself, because she needed to understand that if he died, then she would die too, or she would be devoured by zombies, or the same thing could happen to her due volume. Melinda lowered her head and apologized to Mason for hitting him. It was all emotional. She didn't want to hurt him. She just wants to survive at any cost, no matter what it costs her. She understood perfectly well that the world around them was absolutely not a place where she could survive just because she wanted it. So she, as a fragile girl, needed male protection. Mason calmed down a little and the tension between them began to subside. He began to explain to her that the man she saw was very dangerous. He feeds people to his pet pigs. A cry of indignation was heard at the other end of the ship. It was Tom. 
he shouted to Mason not to spread deceptive rumors about him. At the entrance to the ship, Tom stood with a scythe at the ready. He said that pigs eat zombies, not people, so he disinfects them in detergent so that they are safe food for pigs. Tom laughed and realized that he could easily play with their feelings. He heard their arguments very well and thought that he could convince the girl to voluntarily go with him. Tom realized that Mason did not go inside his basement and did not have time to see the people hanging on hooks. It would be a shame to give good quality human meat to pigs. Tom continued talking and said that the girl would obviously be safer with him, in a cozy, warm house, where there was plenty of food and no zombies, like here on the ship. Tom said that if she stays with Mason, then either she will be eaten by zombies, or she herself will become a zombie. She doesn't have many options here, or of course he will be glad to see her in his house. Tom understood that the girl was confused and wanted to finally get to a safe place. He said that such a beautiful girl like her should live in a warm place with good food. She was shivering from the cold, and Tom said that he had several canned meats at home for her. There was still hot coffee and many other goodies that they had dreamed of for so long after the zombie apocalypse. He lured her to him with all his possibilities. Tom said that he would not allow the girl to die, freeze or remain hungry. He could give all this to her if she was a grateful girl and did what he told her. Melinda held her neck, remembering how Tom met her, and wondering what the right thing to do now, and who to believe. Tom said that he understands perfectly well how those scum treated her. They are simply not people, but real animals who cover up their vile actions by living in the church. She looked at Tom in surprise. Did he really know from those scum who had mocked her for so long? Melinda finally lowered her head and didn't know what to do right. Tom said that he had a walkie-talkie with him, and although the signal was quite weak, the former prisoners living in the church would definitely hear it. He said that they should be glad that that he found their girl. Hearing his words and thinking about those bastards, Melinda could not stand it and began to cry. Tom saw this and realized that he had a great effect on the girl's consciousness. He took off the mask and asked her not to cry. He is not a bad person at all. Moreover, he is very reasonable, and everything will be fine if they are friends. She must make the decision herself. Tom asked if she would go with him, or return to those dirty scum who are either people nor animals. She began to walk towards Tom and begged him not to tell them anything over the radio. Mason stood in shock and could not believe that Melinda would agree to go to Tom after everything that he told her about him. She cried and slowly walked towards Tom. He encouraged her and said that this was the right decision on her part. Melinda was almost leaving, but Mason took her hand and asked her not to leave. He said that it was not necessary to choose between two evils. He could help her, because she was talking about the people with whom she had a meeting planned here. Mason asked her to come with him. Together they could cope. They could survive. Melinda stopped, looked at Mason and thought what the right thing to do now because her action could determine her fate. Tom began to approach them. He had already taken out his huge knife. He did not like how Mason behaved from their very first meeting. He behaved like a fool, and then only engaged in sabotage. He slowly approached and asked Mason if he knew why this current world is so good. Without waiting for an answer, he himself said that now there are no rules or laws. Those people who have power can do whatever they want. And now he will also understand this once and for all. Mason raised the machine gun and told him to stay where he was or he would shoot. Mason did not wait and pulled the trigger, but the machine gun did not fire. He clearly did not expect such a turn of events. Tom laughed and asked what happened. Had he run out of bullets? What a shame. Mason lowered the machine gun and cowered in fear. Tom stood on the head of the dead red-eyed zombie and asked Mason how long he thought it would take him to reach them. Is it possible that during this time Mason will have time to get the bullets? reload the machine gun and shoot. Tom got ready to run and said that they would check it now. It was scary not only for Melinda, but also for Mason. The two of them were trembling. It was not clear whether it was from the cold or from fear. But one thing was clear that Mason would definitely not be able to reload the machine gun so quickly, especially since Tom handled knives very well and could kill him with great speed. Stepping back, he came across a metal rod sticking out of a broken wall. Then a thought came to his mind. Perhaps this very rod could save them. Mason grabbed this rod with his bare hand so tightly that some of its pointed parts began to dig into his skin and bring unbearable pain. Mason walked away and pulled the rod behind him with all his strength. Tom took off and ran over the zombie corpses with great speed. He liked this game. 
He was not afraid of death and finally wanted to take revenge on Mason. In a few seconds, Tom had already reached Mason and was ready to cut off his head with a scythe as he ran, like a small blade of grass in a field. However, at the right moment, Mason let go of the rod, which he had been pulling with all his might. With tremendous speed and force, the metal rod rushed to its original position. Tom did not at all expect that his face would be in the path of this metal rod. The blow hit Tom right in the eye and was able to immediately cool the ardor of the insatiable beast on the path to murder and destruction. Blood gushed like a river from Tom's face. He held his face trying to stop the bleeding, and kept asking Mason what he had done. Mason wasted no time, he grabbed his wagon. Then he immediately took Melinda by the hand, and they began to run without looking back. They had no way back. They both understood that Tom would not leave them alone, but perhaps these injuries would delay him enough to run away and hide his tracks. Tom stood covered in blood and looked after them. Could they really fool him again? A few minutes later, Tom came to his senses a little from his injuries and pain shock. Was this bastard really taking his things again right in front of his eyes? Oh well, they will have the opportunity to play this game again. He walked from the ship to his home and thought about how he could better finish off this impudent man. This incident happened to him for the first time, and he needs to be killed in some original way. Tom, holding his face, slowly walked to his room, and the realization came to him that his left eye was badly damaged. He couldn't see anything with them anymore. He began to nervously look for something in his nightstand, making sounds of groaning and pain. He finally found a bottle of water, and reassured himself that one eye still saw everything, as before. He poured a bottle of water on his face and said that this kid still has a lot to learn. If he were in his place, he would gouge out both eyes and run away for this time it would be certain death. Tom threw the bottle aside and now the hare hunt could begin. He turned on the radio and asked if there was anyone on the air from the gang. One of the bandits immediately answered him, saying that they were in touch. Tom said that two young men were moving towards them. When they spotted them, they should just pass on their coordinates. Tom ordered the bandits not to touch any of them. He just needed information about where they were. Until he arrives, he asks not to capture them but better not to show in any way that they have been spotted and are being monitored. The bandit replied that he would report his request to the top, and only then they would give him an answer. Tom could not stand it, and said that he did not care about his reports. If not for him, then none of this small gang would have survived, and if he gives orders, then these pathetic bandits simply must carry them out unquestioningly. He thirsted for revenge. Tom said that if these two did not run faster than the wind— then very soon they would be in his hands. He wanted them to have hope of salvation, and that was to die quickly. Time moved again to the moment the disaster began. A woman and a man approached the helipad. The military man loudly asked what their position was. The man said that the woman who was with him was the head of the Department for State Crisis Situations, and he was her secretary. The military man said that everything was correct and they were already expected. The woman asked where they were going to which the soldier replied that they would be informed after they landed. The pilot immediately began to lift the bird into the air. The pilot said that they would not fly comfortably, but in ten minutes they would arrive at the place where the river was flooded. The director of the department asked what kind of place this was and what exactly happened there, to which the pilot informed her that this was a secret operation, and she could only find out the details on the spot from their leadership. The director said that she has a daughter who should arrive in Korea very soon, she definitely needs to tell her whereabouts. But the military man replied that he was of course very sorry, but he still wouldn't say where exactly they were going. The assistant said that he would know everything as soon as they landed, so there was no need to worry. The director tried to write a message, but there was no connection. The military man said that there is no connection at all. Most likely this is due to this and looked up at the falling meteorite. The assistant handed the director his phone and said that if you write from it, there is a much better chance that the message will be delivered. The director took the phone and started typing. She thought that now, probably, many residents are experiencing difficulties not only with communication. She typed a message as the helicopter approached the ship at the pier. People crowded around it, but only those who provided special passes and were on the military lists could pass through. The director of the department flew straight to the ship's helipad. She quickly walked up to one of the mission leaders and asked what about Mr. He turned to her and asked what she meant. The director asked if everything was okay with him. The manager asked who exactly she was talking about, the president or the minister of internal affairs. 
the director said that he perfectly understands who she is asking about. The man calmly said that there would be a meeting at 7 o'clock in the evening, so they should go together and register as arrivals. And he added that he did not yet know how to answer her question. She looked outside and asked in horror what these people were thinking about. The man interrupted her and asked if she had received the second vaccine, to which the director replied that if she had not injected herself with the vaccine, she would not have even been taken on the helicopter. The man asked if her daughter had received the vaccine, to which the director replied that she had been vaccinated before leaving the country. What about the third vaccine? The man asked. The director said she was sent to where there was a third vaccine. The man said that getting the third vaccine is not necessary if you have already had the first two. The director said that they couldn't tell him anything else. The first vaccine cost one and a half million dollars. The second vaccine cost nine hundred thousand dollars. But she suddenly stopped without telling how much the third vaccine cost. She looked at the pier, where people were crowding, how they could not understand that not all of them would sail on this ship. They were interrupted by a child's cry. With a cry from his mother, the little boy ran headlong towards his mother. The director just had time to squat down when the tomba rushed into her arms. The kid enthusiastically asked his mother if she had seen the sky. The director said that they had nothing to fear, because this ship is one of the most protected places on earth. Therefore, no matter what happens, he should not leave his mother for even a second. The kid asked where his sister was, had she really not arrived yet. The director tried to calm the boy down, and with a smile on her face said that she would definitely bring his sister here. The kid looked up at the sky again. There, one by one, fiery stones flew to the ground at great speed. It was Melinda's mother. It was she who sent her messages when they fell. And the main message of these messages was that you need to survive, at any cost. It was these words of her mother that gave her a chance and hope for salvation. At this time, Melinda and Mason moved forward away from all the horrors that they encountered along the way. Mason turned around and asked Melinda who this person she so wanted to meet was. Could it be one of her family members? Melinda didn't say anything, but simply nodded her head. Mason said that he only had a grandmother, who died a month before all this horror began. He grinned. Would she really be afraid of zombies? With a smile on his face, he encouraged Melinda and said that her family would definitely survive. After all, the main thing is to believe in it, and then everything will definitely be fine. These words actually cheered her up a little. At this time, a dull thud sounded on the ship they had just left, over and over again, as if someone was knocking on the door in a certain sequence. This was the same little boy who was now hardly a simple, friendly boy. Now it was a bloodthirsty red-eyed zombie. And since Melinda's brother was here, this could only mean one thing. This destroyed ship was the very ship of salvation that Melinda was in such a hurry to get to. The baby fulfilled his promise. He still did not leave his mother, and they were close to the very end even after death. The mother growled and watched as her still-living daughter left the place where she was supposed to go. Melinda had absolutely no idea where to go and what lay ahead for them. But now both she and Mason had hope, and this is the strongest motivator for survival in this harsh, lifeless world. At this time, the fireplace was burning in the bandits' camp. One of them was humming a song to himself and making coffee. Today he was supposed to have the most delicious coffee on the entire planet. He wiped the cup thoroughly. He placed it on a tray with a plate of sliced toast and pieces of meat, then poured a cup of coffee. He said with joy and pleasure from his work that breakfast was ready. Approaching the luxurious bed, he called out to Edward, who was the leader of their gang. He sat down on the bed and said that he was tired of smelling that nasty aroma of coffee every morning, and also this nasty voice of his subordinates. The guy's name was Sam, and he said with a grin that Edward always liked everything but he immediately interrupted him and ordered him to shut up so that he could start at least one day in a good mood. Edward took a cup of coffee to start his breakfast. Sam said that in the morning they received a call from a canning factory. Edward stood up and headed to the window, and Sam humbly followed him. He reported that some girl had most likely escaped from the factory. Edward immediately asked where she went, to which Sam immediately replied that she was heading in their direction. Edward asked whether the girl was alone or not. Sam said that from the messages from the factory it was clear that she was with some young guy. He laughed and said that Tom wouldn't tolerate that. Edward drank his coffee slowly and asked what Tom said in the message about these escapees. Tom said to catch the two, and then he himself would come and deal with them, 
Edward liked this, he laughed and said that he simply could not wait for Tom to come running to them with bulging eyes and beg them to give up the prisoners. Sam, shyly, reminded Edward that they were related by blood, they were cousins, so he has a small request. Edward took another sip of his coffee and asked what his request was. He reminded him of one of the gang members named Henry. Every time he ignores his orders in front of the others, but if he had a badge of honor, he would obviously stop doing that. They are relatives. Can't he really give him such a badge? Edward asked what he wanted from him, to which Sam replied that if Edward, as the king of their gang, punished Henry for his behavior, then he would never disobey his orders again. Well, or giving him a badge could greatly increase his reputation in their small society. Edward looked at him horribly. He took a walkie-talkie from his pocket and ordered Henry to go up to the room. Sam immediately thought that his time had come. Now that Edward would punish Henry for disobedience, he would definitely be on top. Edward placed his cup on the tray. Sam quickly carried the tray to the table, like an obedient dog. He was so happy that he was even ready to jump on the spot. Would Edward really punish that bastard Henry? Now he would definitely be finished. A minute later Henry knocked on the door, opened it, and asked if he could come in. Edward sat down on the bed and, smiling at Henry's appearance, told him to come in. Sam stood there with a big smile on his face and waited for Edward to tear Henry apart right in front of him. But Edward calmly asked Henry why Sam had been pestering him all morning about their relationship. Henry even sweated a little. He knew very well that Sam was the cousin of their leader. But because he was not far in mind, he never listened to him. Henry said that he simply asked Sam not to interfere in their affairs. Sam said that he didn't just tell him not to interfere in their affairs. He scolded him like some kind of child in front of everyone. This is real humiliation. Henry stood with his head down and Edward laughed. Henry said it was true. He might have gone a little overboard. Edward stood up and, without ceasing to laugh, said that no matter how many times he taught him, he still attacked over and over again like a poisonous snake. Sam also laughed with Edward, but did not immediately understand his words. Edward said that such people must be killed until one day they want to kill him. Edward asked Henry if he understood what was being said. Henry bowed and apologized for the fact that his club was very light. Sam began to understand whether it was their boss who was reprimanding him now. Edward asked why Henry was still standing. Maybe he should teach the boy a lesson for his insolence. Henry looked at Sam from under his forehead and said that he could use some pain. Sam was shocked by what was happening. How did it happen that the conversation turned against him? This is not what they agreed on. Henry was already there and started beating the bastard Sam. Edward didn't look at it. Henry asked if it was necessary to take the badges from the bastard. Edward said that he could only take one badge from him because if you took away all the badges from him, he would definitely die on the street. The sounds of impacts continued, and Edward decided that now was the time to drink some coffee to relax. At some point, Edward turned around and asked Henry to send the children to work. He stopped his beating of Sam and said that he would immediately carry out the assignment. After that, he let Sam go. Sam fell to the floor like a piece of meat, choking on his own blood. He tried to get up and spat blood mixed with saliva on the floor. Sam said that he would also go right away to carry out the boss's instructions. Edward approached him and asked where he was in such a hurry. Sam looked at his cruel brother with fear and did not understand what he wanted from him. Edward picked up a hockey stick and said it was time for the second lesson. The second lesson is aimed at moral education, swinging well with a hard wooden stick. Edward landed a clean blow right on his stupid brother's ass. The sounds of blows continued one after another. Edward repeated only two words, hierarchy in order, hierarchy in order. After a minute the sounds of blows stopped, and he ordered Sam to gather everyone. Edward asked how well Sam understood the lesson he once again taught him. Suddenly there was a knock on the door. It was a guy named Ray. Edward said that he was always glad to see him, and allowed him to enter. He poked Sam's ass with a stick and said that today he would go to the second subway line along with the slaves in order to bring at least some benefit. Sam was glad that this beating was over. He didn't care where to go as long as it was over. He asked permission to return before dinner. He couldn't leave his boss hungry. Sam crawled slowly, and Ray approached Edward. The boss ordered him to speak, but he waited until Sam crawled out of the room. As soon as the door closed, Ray said that they had a problem with zombies at the subway station. Edward took Ray by the prosthetic arm and raised him. He asked if everything was okay with his arm. Ray did not immediately know what to answer, and said that it had been a long time. 
Edward laughed and said that the fight was too much for him. Ray said that everything is fine now and his arm doesn't hurt. The boss smiled and said that Ray probably still hated him for losing his arm. But Ray immediately stopped him and said that Edward was doing what a leader should do, and he was even grateful to him for bringing him back to understanding, when he didn't understand who was in charge here. Edward looked at him sternly and asked if he really thought so. Ray, without thinking for a long time, confirmed his words. Then the boss asked if he cut off his leg now, he would also be grateful, to which Ray immediately agreed. The boss praised him for being so aware of his guilt and asked what was wrong with the zombies, to which Ray replied that he had killed every last zombie on the station. Edward asked why he didn't leave a few zombies alive, because he needed to think a little more broadly than usual. They need zombies, and the more the better. People should live in fear to thank them for every breath and life saved, so that when they give them dog food, they look at them with eyes full of fear and respect. For whether it is a man or a woman, will they be unhappy with the fact that they are saving them from such an inevitable death? They will be forever grateful and happy from such care from their owners. They will want to live in this city, even if they work day and night, they will work and not ask questions. Ray apologized for his offense and said that he would go look for zombies on the ferry, or near the river, most likely, if he walked around with a piece of meat in his hand, he would clearly be able to collect several dozen zombies. Edward said that this time he would forgive Ray, but next time he could lose more than just his arm for such a mistake. Ray asked if he could go and was about to get down to business, but Edward stopped him. He thought that if some girl made Tom himself worry, then she was definitely unusual. Maybe we should try it out first before Tom gets here. Ray said that he would be on the lookout, and as soon as she was caught they would immediately bring her to him. Edward snapped his fingers and said that this was the right approach. The boss with a smile on his face said that he trusted him and expected only positive results. As soon as Ray left, the smile disappeared from Edward's face. He gritted his teeth and thought that he should have also cut off his leg then. Then he would definitely not have brought trouble. After thinking a little about what to do, Edward radioed for everyone to dress in white. Two girls immediately entered his room. He ordered them to dress him in white today and even his guards to look like holy men. The girls smiled and obeyed him unquestioningly. They began to dress their master, and never ceased to admire him and compliment him. While the girls were dressing Edward, he called the guards. They peered through the door and listened intently to their boss. Edward asked if they had heard about the search for two young people that Tom was doing from the factory. The guards said that they knew about this. Then Edward instructed them to send three more people to search, and to bring the girl to him alive. One of the girls knelt before him and said that their boss was too tense. This couldn't continue. She began to stretch his pants in order to do the usual thing. Before that she asked permission to train the boss's new girl. Edward was not against her noble urges. Meanwhile, Mason and Melinda walked along the trees withered from the cold. Suddenly they came across something unusual, and both stopped, looking at what happened with fear and misunderstanding. Mason said that it was definitely not zombies who did this. It was a paradoxical stripping. Melinda asked him what he meant. Mason said that when a person begins to feel extreme cold, his brain turns off and hallucinations or amnesia appear. Their mind becomes cloudy. So in extreme cold, their body begins to release heat so that the person does not freeze, after which they feel that the body is very hot and begin to undress. And this is the spectacle you can see as a result of this terrible incident. Apparently these were living people who took off their clothes on their own and froze to death. A human hand began to rise from the broken tree behind them. Our heroes did not pay any attention to this at all. Mason asked Melinda if there were any skyscrapers in the city, or maybe underground shelters. Where are all the shelters that are prepared in case of danger? While Mason was fiddling with his things, he saw movement begin at the base of the broken tree. As an experienced military man, he immediately took the shooting position pointed his machine gun at the tree and loudly ordered to come out slowly with his hands raised. Mason told Melinda to prepare for the worst. There was clearly someone inside, but one way or another he was in no hurry to go outside. If it was a zombie, then it was very smart, since it did not immediately rush to its prey. Mason said that they know very well that someone is hiding there, and if he does not want to become a sieve, then he better come out. First, the man in the hollow of the tree showed his hands and then all of them appeared on the street. He asked for help, saying that he was already quite old and would soon die, like everyone else. Mason was in no hurry to trust him, therefore, without taking his sights away, 
he asked who he was and what he was doing here. The man said that he was an ordinary grandfather who had once been a taxi driver, and he didn't care whether they killed him or saved him. They looked at him with distrust, but at first glance there were no signs of trouble. Mason said that something is wrong here. What if this grandfather is from the bandit camp? Grandfather slowly took step by step in their direction and said that he was not a bandit and had not been in the city where they lived for a long time. He said that he, like his other friends, were kicked out of the city. They were told that they were old and were taking food away from the young and were practically of no use. The stranger extended his hand and asked them to look. The bandits had once cut off his fingers, justifying it by the fact that he did not obey them. The old man fell into the snow and said that while he was here, his friends were dying one by one. Someone died from the cold, someone died from being eaten by zombies, someone died at the hands of living people. Tears flowed from his eyes and dripped onto the snow. The old man said that this was a real hell, and death was pursuing him as the last survivor. If this is not hell, then where is its location? Melinda couldn't stand it. She came up to him, put her hand on his shoulder, and said that he needed to fight. He is still alive, and while they are people they have every chance to overcome these terrible trials that God sent them. The old man listened to her words and thanked her for her support. He saw a tattoo on the girl's neck and asked what kind of tattoo it was. The old man said that he often saw such tattoos on bandits from the city. Melanie immediately covered her neck with a scarf and said that she had nothing to do with them. The old man immediately began to say that the main target of the bandits was the metro. So why did they come here then? Mason asked the old man what he knew about these bandits. But the old man said that they knew better. They were much younger than him. They had captured almost the entire city and ruled it as they wanted. The old man looked carefully at Melinda and said that he had already seen her somewhere. At least they looked very familiar. He took a closer look at the girl again and remembered if it was really her. The old man couldn't believe his eyes. He really didn't expect to meet a celebrity in such a situation. He was very happy and said that despite the fact that there is a zombie apocalypse around now, he just had to get an autograph from her. He didn't know where it would be better for him to get an autograph, maybe at least in the snow, but Mason stopped him and asked the old man to tell him more about the city and the bandits. The old man calmed down a little and began his story. His name is Edward. He is about twenty years old. Now is not the time for a king to be at the head of the people, but he can cut off your ears if you do not listen to him. If you are stronger than him, he can cut off your legs, and if you are smarter than him, he will throw you into a mine. The old man said that he was an absolute rude man. One might even say a tyrant. Mason asked what they should do if they suddenly get there. The old man said that all their things would be taken away from them. They would be thrown to the very bottom of the food chain, where such people are called slaves, and they would be exploited. And the girl will most likely become his mistress, whom he will use, like others, for sexual pleasures. Melinda understood very well what it was like to be a sex slave, and the mere mention of it filled her with a feeling of fear. The old man put on his hat and said that men now rise from the bottom, and girls fall from the top. Melinda remained silent because she did not know what to answer the old man. She took a piece of paper out of her pocket and asked the old man if he knew the way to this place, bypassing the city. The old man took the paper and said that we need to think carefully. The note stated the location relative to the city. He said this is the location of an underground bunker. They asked the old man in surprise how he knew this, to which he replied that he periodically took people there when he worked as a taxi driver, who loved to tell stories about their lives to a simple taxi driver. The old man said that he knew well where this place was, but it would be very difficult to get there without entering the city. The old man said that this is a protective bunker left after the war, but why do they want to go there? Mason said that the girl's family was waiting for her there, and he just followed her. The old man was surprised. Only influential people could visit this bunker, which means the girl has very rich relatives. The old man nudged Mason with a smile and asked him what their relationship was. Mason laughed and said that he, too, had only seen her on TV. The old man said that it means that he, like Mason, first saw her live only after the apocalypse. Mason said that everything was exactly like that. Mason looked at the lying human bodies and asked the old man what to do with them. He thought a little and said that they should not be touched. They had been lying there for a long time. If the bandits noticed their movement, they would understand that we were here. The old man said his name was John and he would show them how to get there, but it would be very difficult to get there without going on the subway. 
The only entrance is a white hole. That's what they called the mine they were forced to work in. There are a lot of pieces of ice that they extracted things from. But this mine has its own peculiarity. If you are distracted for even a second, you will not be able to understand where is up and where is down. There is ice all around, and this white shine makes you lose your mind, and if you miss the person in front of you, you will get lost. These stories did not greatly inspire Mason and Melinda. The old man hastened to reassure them, he had once laid a path there, and if they could secretly enter this mine, the old man would guide them. But in return he wants only one thing. He laughed and said that he wanted them to promise that they would take him with them. At first glance, one could say that John was an ordinary old man who was simply lucky to survive in such conditions. And of course Mason and Melinda agreed to take him, because without him they had no chance of getting to their destination, especially when they were being hunted so many people want to kill them.